broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America, bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. That's right. We are the longest running talk show on computers and technology. Thank you so much for joining us. I am your host, Ben Crossman, and welcome into another edition of the Computer America Show. And we have a great show lined up for you today because, that's right, we have one of our favorite guests on, and we tell that to not everyone, I promise, only him. We have one of our favorite guests on, Mr. Ralph Bond. That's right. He's with Autodesk and we are going to be doing a lot of different news stories about the latest developments in, you know, new technology and things like that. Always a lot of fun. And some things you should know, including ComputerAmerica.com. That will have everything you need to know, including the show notes. And the show notes are especially important. That's right. This time, because Ralph does a very good job of going and collecting all of the stories, all of the links, and doing a lot of the research for you. So if you want to check anything out that we talk about here on the show today, then all you have to do, head on over to our website, go to the show notes, and it's all right there with pictures and the articles and, you know, who made them, all that good stuff. Yep, find it there at ComputerAmerica.com. And while you're there, be sure to check out some other stuff we do, including the video portion, where you not only get to listen to Computer America, but you can watch Computer America as well. Just another way to experience and, hey... You know, on days such as today, we get to follow along, we get to check out the videos, we get to check out the demonstrations, we get to do all of that, again, through the video portion. Check it out. And then the last thing is our social media contest, where every single Friday, we give away an M720 Logitech mouse, giving one away this Friday, and hope, hopefully you enter, because, you know, it's very simple, and you can enter like six, seven, eight different ways. And, you know, it's very, very easy. And you could be winning something and hearing your name read live on the air. That's right. So, with all of that said, I think we're just going to jump right into today's show. Because, again, Ralph Bond, longtime Computer America correspondent, always a fun guy to be around. And, Ralph, welcome on to the Computer America Show. Hey, it's great, as always, to be with you. And as you said, the show notes are important, people, because it gives you all the information, links, pictures, links to videos and so forth, but equally important, if we don't get a chance to cover all the stories I've gathered for this month, you can use it as like a homework assignment. You can go back and as a fun reading assignment. So get those show notes. Nothing gets people excited quite like homework. So I'm glad that you mentioned <laughs> that. But no, I, you know, uh, we do not always get to all the stories. And, you know, there are a lot of interesting ones that we wish we could get to, but time constraints being what they are. So... In the meantime, everyone, ComputerAmerica.com, right there, there'll be a big button. It says uh, Cheat Sheet, and that will be where you find it. So, with that being said, Ralph, uh, you know, unless there's anything else you should mention, I think we should get started with story. Well, yeah, let's start at the beginning. Why not? Story number yeah, one. Yeah, sure. Let's do it. Okay, so the first story comes from Engadget Magazine, uh, featured by Andrew Tarantola, and its title is MIT. Always love stuff out of MIT labs, right? I mean, those it's, uh, they're an unending source of great stories. So MIT's mobile 3D printer built the largest structure, and they mean a building, to date, and in just 13 hours. So once again, folks, you really need to see the images and the videos and so forth to appreciate what we're talking about and also the link to the original story. And oh, by the way, one thing I'll mention at the outset here is I extract often portions from these stories so if you want the full story again the show notes will give you the link to the entire story so i encourage everybody to get those show notes but with that said let's go on uh, if you have the show notes on your screen you can see this amazing uh, device this arm that's starting to uh, deposit or print a circular igloo igloo like structure but here's the story let's get into the article it says your next house could be built by a robot 
following the recent success of San Francisco-based startup APIS, that's A-P-I-S, separate word, CORE, C-O-R, a team of MIT researchers have created a mobile, autonomous 3D printer of their own. And to prove that the prototype works, the team built a 12-foot tall, 50-foot wide igloo out of quick setting foam, the largest such structure made by a robot to date. And again, there's a link to the video. It's really interesting pictures and so forth. And goes on to say the team recently published their work in the Journal of Science Robotics, arguing that automation should help lower construction costs and expedite building times. Their creation, dubbed the Digital Construction Platform, consists of a large hydraulic arm mounted on caterpillar treads. So you got to see the picture of this thing to catch on to what, you're, what they're talking about. At the tip of its arm, the team installed a one-fingered gripping attachment, though it can be swapped out. Here's the brilliant part of it. It can be swapped out for a number of different tools, including foam and thermoplastic extruders, a welder, a water hose, or a bucket. An interesting array of things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Rather than rely on fossil fuels, the entire 81,000-pound system, let that sink in for a moment, is solar-powered. What? I like that. Isn't that something? I mean, it's it's just kind of hitting all cylinders of, of grooviness here. And I want you to go back and think about that bit about how it can do the extruders, thermoplastic extruder, or a welder. So the possibilities for this device are pretty darned interesting. Uh, let's see, the article goes on to say the setup makes the digital construction platform ideal for off-world construction projects. Ding, ding, ding. That means for potential construction on the moon or Mars or something like that. Uh, I think that's interesting, but I'm going to make a comment after I finish reading this passage that where I think it really has profound possibilities. So again, it says this setup makes the digital construction platform ideal for off-world construction projects, especially when combined with some of MIT's other 3D printed programs like its foundry software and memory shape materials. And there's links in the story here, folks, you can learn more about what they're talking about here. However, the platform still needs further development before it starts working on real world construction sites. And a little bit mm -hmm. of conclusion here from my extraction, and then I wanna make a comment about where I really think this has application immediately. Sure. The team wants to install proximity sensors for one, in order to prevent the machine from running into structures or people as it moves about the work site. That makes sense. They should probably address the whole uh, doesn't do right angles issue as well <laughs> because <laughs> it is a rotational thing. But Ben, maybe you were thinking the same thing as I was reading through this story is off-world construction projects. Sure, that's interesting. But let's talk about the real world here and now. Let's talk about disaster situations or um, refugee camps, or any number of these things where maybe a foam extruded igloo wouldn't, igloo wouldn't be your idea of a permanent home, but if you need a fast temporary structure, uh, IKEA has been working on this a lot with their kind of ship out to on-site refugee camp things, but this again could give you even something more durable uh, and quickly and cost effectively. So I think that's the thing that I love about this story is the possibilities, and then that welding bit. That means you can do things. There's some guys, uh, MX3, I think is the name of the company. MX3 mm -hmm. is has robots. That, well, there's a robot on each end of the um, little mini river, and they're building with robotic arms and welding and extruding um, material. They're building a bridge that will meet in the middle. It, it's just this, all this autonomous robotic stuff is fascinating, and I think this story is a real winner on many levels. Yeah, I, you know, MIT, they uh, they obviously dabble in, you know, what's everything. new, what's cutting edge, <laughs> and, and yeah, yeah, and definitely everything. So you can see why, you know, they took solar power instead of, hey, just put a diesel engine in it and call it a day. They had to make it solar power. So obviously there are constraints there. Like, they didn't make this easy on themselves, and they still came up with a very cool project. Um, Obviously, this is not the, you know, and, and you know, uh, I think we've covered it here on the show with you, but we've seen other examples of this that 
are a little bit more sophisticated where they mm-hmm. you know where they can do right angles and they can you know mm-hmm. build yeah. build a floor plan instead of just building a little igloo but the fact that this is portable solar power and you know easy to move around is you know very very good for disaster for disaster situations like you said um yeah. i you know you're right this one did hit a lot of really good points so you know kudos to mit yeah once again it never it never ends with those guys and as you said the fact that it's portable and programmable and can be autonomous imagine a set of these devices in an open situation uh controlled by a single computer program wirelessly communicating to the devices to please print me out 10 igloos here of varying sizes perhaps i, I mean the possibilities are <laughs> or yeah or not even that just you know uh print me out you know four igloos but they all need to be connected and yeah. you know you make yourself a compound just like that yeah yeah there you go they're very very cool so very cool stuff yeah and of course you know they said it needs more development that is that pesky thing that you know sometimes <laughs> it can crush people so yeah all that <laughs> yeah 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 that, that pesky thing um and, and you know and again kind of branching off the idea that it reduces construction costs uh, this is something that comes up in our talks a lot, Ralph. Automation mm-hmm. taking jobs, mm-hmm. like, like you know, reducing mm-hmm. costs is code for mm-hmm. taking jobs. Yeah, there always is that dilemma right. in, in technology. There's, oh my gosh, and you know, talk about that. I'm sure you've been you've been hearing all the hubbub about uh, the stock trading industry, the Wall Street guys and gals, and the idea that that uh, artificial intelligence based programs are going to s- start acing out real human beings running and buying and purchasing and managing stock portfolios and so forth that's you want to you know, talk about an industry that's not, being frightened right, by this it's right. scary not 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 to get off on too much of a tangent but I, yeah. I i i haven't heard about stock brokers it makes perfect sense because you know artificial intelligence really great at taking mm-hmm. large mm-hmm. sums of data and making mm-hmm. you know intuitive decisions that's what ai mm-hmm. specializes in mm-hmm. um but no the the other one i heard were ceos you know there was a ceo that said <laughs> Within 20 to 30 years, you know, corporations that have to come up with a plan, act on data, and say what's in the best interest of the company, that's going to be automated in 20 to 30 wow. years by AI. I mean, wow, yeah, really, that's a yeah. that's a pretty interesting. It's almost on the border of sci-fi kind of thing, but I I wouldn't poo-poo it and dismiss it out of hand. But and certainly a lot of stockholders would like to see uh, high-ranking people that cost millions of dollars a year in salaries and bonuses and so forth be replaced by a much less expensive ai solution so right well, wouldn't that be a great premise for a, a, a film i think a sci-fi film could be pretty interesting right well, well it's not just cheaper but it's also you know ai at some point are going to be better at correlating data and right. making decisions from it that right. and that and that's a lot of uh, white collar jobs but again not too much of a tangent mit kudos to that and again i like how they made it portable they made it solar they made it yeah. easy and cheap no good stuff all around so yeah all right so this next one and yes you, you know uh, finger devices let users touch virtual objects i mean virtual reality it has some very cool applications mm-hmm. you know like movie and viewing kind of thing mm-hmm. but the fact that you can't in, you know interact really feel what you right. touch is right. a bit is a big limitation so what's the solution that they've come up with well yeah and this is a great story from science magazine a story by matthew hudson as you said before the title of the article is finger devices let users touch virtual objects oh yeah this is a great top haptic stuff is is a science that's very very interesting but this seems like a, a pretty important uh, move forward let's put it that way and my notes in the show notes actually remind everyone please go and read the full article because remember i do generally speaking just extractions unless the article is very short right mm-hmm. so here's the feature it says less than a year ago augmented reality now i'm going to stop because augmented reality is a term, I, I know you understand what it means, Ben, but just to make sure everybody in the audience understands, because we hear so much about virtual reality, right. right? Now, virtual reality is probably the simplest thing is think of putting on your Oculus Rift goggles or something and and through computer uh, and the goggles and so forth, or your smartphone stuck into one of those little inexpensive goggles, and, and you imagine yourself in an environment you can look up and look down and maybe walk forward and so forth and so on in some kind of environment. That's virtual reality. What is augmented reality? Augmented reality is really interesting. I want you to picture in your mind holding up an iPad on a construction site and seeing the um, 
frame of the high rise building that you're working on overlaid over the current empty lot. So you're, the camera on the iPad is showing you the current empty lot, but superimposing, aka augmented reality, augmenting the reality with the image perfectly positioned of where the building's going to be. Or the construction worker goes up to a wall that's in construction now and can see where the electrical and plumbing and HVAC are going to be routed. Mm -hmm. That sort of thing. That's big, augmented reality. Absolutely big shocker that Ralph Bond from Autodesk would choose the construction application yes. for... <laughs> but uh, and, and, and guilty as charged. <laughs> and and just to be uh, clear, th there's another term out there that is essentially just what Ralph Bond explained. Microsoft is trying to push it. I don't know if it's catching on or not, but it's uh -huh. called uh, mixed reality, where it's just augmented reality. But Microsoft kind of cool. I, right. I think mixed reality is good. I I have to be honest, and I I'm very I, I respect Microsoft a lot. Mm -hmm. Mixed reality is is okay, but really to me the, the meaning of it. When you augment reality, right. that really resonates more with me. I get where they're going with mixed reality, but we digress. Right. We Let's digress. go back to the story. <laughs> Less than a year ago, augmented reality, digital effects laid on top of the real world as seen through a computer screen or tablet or smartphone, folks, burst into public consciousness with the release of the mobile game Pokemon Go, mm -hmm. right? In which players see magical little monsters in the real world using their smartphones. Now, a team of engineers has done them one better. With finger-worn devices, users can feel virtual objects around them while still maintaining the ability to pardon me, still maintaining the ability to grasp other actual objects. The new technology could upgrade everything from video games to e-commerce to neurosurgery. Hmm. Says here, over the years, Engineers have constructed gloves with motors or electrodes designed to provide tactile or haptic, H-A-P-T-I-C, feedback. That You and I are very familiar with this. I know uh, Craig is very familiar with this too. But because most cover the fingertips, users have to remove them before they can feel a real object. Devices mm -hmm. that leave the fingertips free don't give the fingers much feedback or consist of ungainly exoskeletons on the back of the hands. So, Dom Domenico Praticizio, I'm perfect, amazing. Name. Did I get it right? P R A T T I C H I Z Z O. I won't Probably. Even try to say it again. <laughs> so, we'll call him by his first name, Domenico, <clears throat> a robotics engineer at the University of Siena in Italy, and his collaborators designed two devices that enable users to feel virtual objects, which they put into a test paper to be published in the IEEE Transactions on Haptics. Now, one fits over the fingertip like a chunky thimble. It has a thin plate controlled by three tiny motors that presses against the finger pad. The plate is thin enough to let users pick up real objects, but substantial enough to make them think they are touching real objects, even when none is there. The other is a ring worn high on the finger that uses tiny motors to stretch the skin under the ring when the stretching uh, when the stretching inches from the fingertip combines with visual feedback, the brain essentially fools itself and transfer the sensation to the tip of the finger. What? There are <laughs> again. You got to go back and read the whole article. Well, everybody. yeah, yeah, and and of course, if you're watching the video portion, I mean, you know, we see the picture up there. Makes a lot of sense. But and you know, and, and again, not to uh, get ahead of you, but you know. They're right. It's when you see something virtual, when you see it superimposed mm -hmm. in front of your eyes, and then you get even the slightest bit of touchback, your brain mm -hmm. says, oh, that's a real object. Like, that's all it takes. It's just that yeah. little bit. So, very yeah. cool. Yeah, no, I hear you. And the show notes, again, because these are extractions, there's a reference to a fellow named Otadui, O-T-A-D-U-I, in this next passage. But here's the point. There are several possible applications for this. In medicine, a surgeon might be able to perform remote operations beyond the simple use of a scalpel or train for tumor screening by feeling for virtual lumps in real tissue. What? In telecommunications, people could share touch over the internet. Okay, time out. I know where everyone's going with this. 
<laughs> I already went there. I, I, I didn't think A little history bring it up. lesson. What was it that made VHS win over the Sony beta? Adult videos. Yes. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> so back back you know, I'm sorry, you know, it just it's so obvious it it's painful. Mm -hmm. In telecommunications, people could share touch over the internet. Sensing could also be remote in time. You might record the visual, audio, and tactile se sensations of playing with your child, for example to play uh, back later. Hmm. Uh, Domenico hopes to add vibrations to his wearable devices to simulate texture. He also de He's also developing armbands to provide haptic feedback when lifting heavy virtual objects. Wow. Some of these ideas may soon come to market through his new company, WEART, all caps, W-E-A-R-T. And it closes with a little quote, at least from my extraction here. Uh, my goal, Domenico says, my goal is that we should be able to switch from real to virtual reality in a snap. Interesting I, it, concept. Right, and, and you know, one concept that really stuck out there was this idea of a haptic feedback armband that would, you know, kind yeah. of tell you when you're lifting a heavy object. Now, of course, they're probably going to say heavy, you know, heavy in, in relation, because let's say you're controlling, uh, you know, a robot that can lift thousands of pounds. You know, it's not going to say, oh, that's 300 pounds, so we have to yeah. make it feel like 300. But yeah. I think that would be an amazing way to set, you know, to build in limitations. You know, if the robot only has a safe carrying capacity of 5,000. You try to lift something that's 10,000, and the haptic feedback says, oh, that's way too heavy for you, even though physically you're not lifting anything. I really like that as kind of like a, uh, as a deterrent to, you know, breaking your toys. Uh, yeah. And then again, the other thing you, you step back and it's sort of obvious when you start thinking about the synthesis or coming together of virtual reality, augmented reality, haptic, advanced haptic technologies, mm -hmm. and you start seeing some pretty mind blowing possibilities for combining all this sensory stuff all into one kind of experience. And if you could get it, fluid and and smooth and so forth they could oh, just the, the implications of all this just flatten me they just blow my mind right and, and and it's uh yes it is you know in reference to what we mentioned earlier <laughs> um you know and, and and again you know he he didn't say it in as many words but i feel like by him referencing, you know, you can call back situations that are pre-recorded, pre-ordained. Yes, yes. You know, that that, that, that kind of spells out for it. <laughs> but uh, to take it, but to take it to a more innocent place, of course, um, you know, imagine, you know, playing catch with your dad, you know, for the, you know, for the first time. You could film that, yeah. record that, and you know, you could relive that as many times as you want. I mean, th yeah. this has a really a lot of really cool applications it does it really does and it's all part of this world that's coming faster than a freight train of Absolutely. the combination of these technologies all you know evolving and all web cloud-based blah 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 i mean it just blows my mind all right well how about this one and you know you know it's uh it may not be as far off in the future as you know self-building domes or haptic feedback that lets yeah. you uh recreate experiences but story number three apple they you know they're pretty good at bringing things to market. So mm. what does Apple have here? Well, yeah, this is a story from The Verge, from uh, Kayim Gartenberg, and the title of the story, and this is why it grabbed my attention, Apple patent hints at one day charging your phone over Wi-Fi. Now, a little uh, note that actually the author makes too, is just because Apple's filed a patent doesn't mean it's going to act on it doesn't mean it's necessarily going to come to market. They file patents to protect their intellectual property, right? As all companies do and individuals as well. But with that said, here's the story. It says a new patent filing by Apple indicates that the company is investing the, or, or pardon me, investigating the possibility of one day wirelessly charging devices over a variety of radio frequencies. Get this, including cellular between the 700 megahertz and 2700 megahertz band, Wi-Fi between 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz, and millimeter wave between 10 gigahertz and 400 gigahertz as spotted by Apple Insider. So that's an embedded link giving credit to where this information is coming from that uh, was reported in the Verge article. The patent titled Wireless Charging and communication systems with dual frequency patch antennas details how devices could use beam forming antennas 
similar to those used on the company's existing airport extreme router to locate where a device is physically located and focus the signal there for improved range and charging speeds. Hmm. Goes on to say, in addition to the more general antenna bands, the patent also specifically cites transmitting power through the 60 gigahertz wavelength used by the YGIG, that's W-I-G-I-G, YGIG 802.11AD standard. If you're into Wi-Fi, you know all about the 802.11 standards, right? Mm -hmm. Which makes sense as a frequency choice given that YGIG is a formalized standard that is likely closer to hardware adoption than other millimeter wave solutions. And and just to be clear, 802.11AD, yeah. not AC, because AC has been the, right. the AD, hot topic. Right. So right. AD is the next iteration, but uh, yeah, cool. Yeah, why gig 802.11AD? If you're a Wi-Fi geek, you want to check it out. <laughs> For sure. Goes on to say, obviously, it's worth noting that this is only a patent not an indication that Af Apple is actually working on a magical router that could give you gigabit Wi-Fi while simultaneously charging your iPhone from across the room. But I still think it's pretty, pretty interesting. It would seem to me it would be a great, very appealing product solution. Conclusion of my extraction here says, still, the idea of doubling up the antennas used for Wi-Fi and cellular data to wirelessly charge devices is a clever one, even if true long distance wireless charging is still a long way from practical day to day use. And I can't help but think about um, Tesla, right? Remember Tesla's fantasy was, uh, well, a fantasy, that's a, an unintentionally dismissive term. His vision was somehow transmitting electricity wirelessly. That was Tesla's big, big thing. And that's part of why he's credited as being a pioneer of radio, right? Right. But th this sort of reminds me of this whole kind of vein of wirelessly transmitting energy. And in this case, to uh, charge your phone, a pretty attractive concept. Right. Yeah. The, there, there was the, uh, there's a light bulb experiment where using, I believe it was like radio waves, something like that. He could light a light bulb uh, from, yeah. you know, several miles away. There was that kind right. of thing. And yeah, you know, it's all taking, taking inspiration from that. But at the same time, you know, leave it to Apple. They love eliminating cords. I mean, they've worked it down to the single, uh, you know, the single data cable, the single lightning connector for a lot of their yes. devices. So now they're working on, okay, how do we cut that last cable? I can, that's totally an Apple thing to do. Yeah, I, I agree completely. And it's a fun little trivia thing I can't help. But for some reason, this came to my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, we all know about USB, right? I mean, right. It's, gosh, it's been around forever, it seems like. Well, USB was invented by Intel Corporation. A lot of people don't know that, but it was. And the first commercial laptop to use USB and thus reduce the plethora of goofy, idiosyncratic ports was an Apple uh, laptop. And Andy Grove, who at the time was heading up Intel Corporation, uh, was at a big speech and was talking about this. And the press had a field day with it because it was deemed kind of an embarrassment that this Intel technology was being first implemented by Apple instead of one of the uh, computer makers at the time who were using Intel chips. By the way, for some younger listeners may not realize that once upon a time, Apple did not use Intel microprocessors. That came much later mm -hmm. in the history of the company. So I don't know why I thought about that, but there's <laughs> your mindless trivia factoid for the day. Right, no, make, it's uh, of course very interesting. And Apple, of course, continues on with the, uh, you know, with the idea to cut all of the cords and be revolutionary but as you said simply a patent and you know mm -hmm. if, if they decide to chase us down or if they have someone else chase it down right. uh definitely very very cool so all right and let's see what time is it yeah we have all of like 30 seconds rough what <laughs> why, why don't we tease the uh the next story here because yeah we'll apple, tease it apple to google what's happening yeah apple to google so just for a quick tease the next story is going to talk about Google bringing YouTube Kids app to smart TVs, and it's part of a larger thing we can talk about, Ben, about how these TVs are getting smarter and smarter and how they're getting smarter. So it's a fun story coming up. They're getting smarter and smarter, yet at the same time, they are getting dumber when it comes to security <laughs> and things like that. But it's Hold okay. <laughs> they're very, very cool. So he's, Ralph is right. We'll be right back uh, with, of course, more of Ralph Bond, more stories, more news. And hey, don't forget, show notes, computeramerica.com, all the articles, all the videos that you should check out are available right there. 
So, the music means we have to take a break. We will we will be right back here on Computer America. And that's right. So we have the Google story and we have many, many more, including Amazon and hey, another Google one. We'll be right back. Computer America. We are all Brother Wolf. Ten years ago, a group of locals banded together to create positive change. We took animals into our homes, held adoption events at local retailers, and talked to the community about our mission to help build a no-kill Asheville. A decade later, we have achieved so many victories for animals in need. There's been so much progress, yet there's still so much to do. As part of our year-long celebration, we encourage you to become a member of our special Compassionate Circle program. With a monthly donation of $10 or more, you will have behind-the-scenes access to the work we are doing at Brother Wolf. Our goal is to reach 1,000 members because we receive no government funding. Working together, we can help build and sustain no-kill communities. Learn more at CompassionateCircle.BWAR.org. We are a 501c3 tax-deductible organization. Oh. There we go. And welcome back to the Computer America Show. It is 31 minutes past the hour as we continue on here with the man himself, Ralph Bond. And again, we are doing all these great stories that he's that he has found. And by the way, again, ComputerAmerica.com, if you're just joining us for any reason, welcome into the program. Where have you been? All of our lives. And that's right, ComputerAmerica.com, check out the show notes, uh, everything and anything. So all you have to do, sit back and relax, don't have to worry about writing down anything. So, yeah, we just finished up this one about Apple and how, you know, at least theoretically, they could pursue wireless charging. Very, very cool. And now we're moving on to this next one about smart televisions and, you know, uh, Google and, well, actually YouTube and by extension Google, but YouTube has really been trying to push this idea of live television. You know, they have a YouTube TV and, you know, they, they have, you know, actual broadcasters broadcasting their shows over the YouTube app. I mean, it's something they're really pursuing and they know that one of, you know, one of their largest audiences for YouTube are kids, you know, kids of all ages, but kids in particular. So no surprise, Google and YouTube has their own app for YouTube kids. So what is this? Exactly. Well, we're going to find out that, of course, the YouTube Kids app has been around for a while, but uh, what's happening here is Google's working to get it into the smart TVs that use the Google technology. But anyway, here's the story. It's called Google Brings YouTube Kids, pardon me, Google Brings YouTube Kids app to smart TVs. comes from uh, the next web a story by Rachel Kayser. And again, if you have the show notes, you can get the link and all that good stuff. It says here, Google today, and now this was on April the 26th, so it's a little bit, almost a month ago, but nonetheless, I still think the story is interesting for anybody out there with parents of little kids, okay? So Google today, April 26th, announced the YouTube Kids app is now available on certain smart televisions, meaning children can get a break from staring at the small screen to stare at an even larger screen, which is a bit of a tongue-in-cheek comment. <laughs> the app will be available on a number of different TVs, including Samsung, Sony, and LG WebOS. Google says support for Android TV is coming. For those of you without smart TVs, kids, uh, Kids is also Chromecast ready, meaning the kids app that they're talking about. Uh, YouTube Kids launched in 2015, so it's been around for a while, right? Is a dedicated app parents could rely on to babysit their kids. It comes with robust parental controls, voice commands for children too young to spell, and a number of educational videos aimed at children. Questionable content sprouts up every once in a while, but luckily it's not a majority. YouTube Kids collection of kid-friendly curated content is one of Google's biggest hits. And this is what I didn't realize because, of course, my kids are <laughs> adults <laughs> far and away from being little guys now. But I didn't realize how big it is. So, again, it says YouTube's kids collection of kid-friendly curated content is one of Google's biggest hits. If its reported numbers are any indication, according to YouTube, the kids app has 8 million active weekly viewers in 26 countries. So that's a 
formidable. <laughs> that is a lot of parents sitting their kids down <laughs> in front of the television. That, that's right. But no. And, you know, the whole question with content thing, I remember doing that story. That was, you know, Google right. uses their, their, their algorithm to essentially curate. And sometimes something slips through the cracks. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them being, if you know of the series, Happy Tree Friends. Uh, sounds perfectly inane, but if you've ever seen the animations, they get very grim, very gruesome, very dark, very quickly. Um, e even though it looks like a Saturday morning cartoon show. So, you know, uh, something slips through, but at the same time, yeah, it, it's, it's not very often that as parents, you can, you know, without a lot of, you know, open DNS or some kind of firewall system put in place, not very often you can say, okay, kids, go free on the internet and watch whatever you want because very quickly you can stumble into what you know you don't want them to watch so right. very cool on youtube for this yeah yeah no it, it's an interesting story and again it caught my eye because first and foremost i had no idea how large an audience youtube for kids had so that was kind of a fun story the next one uh, mm -hmm. story number five if you're following along in the show notes this one is <laughs> i'm a big giant fan of amazon prime and a big giant devoted fan of costco because as I've said shamelessly multiple times before, I live in Hillsboro, Oregon. Hillsboro has the world's largest Costco. End mm -hmm. of story. <laughs> no, that, that, that is definitely a feather in your cap because I think, you know, I, I think for a lot of people, Costco and of course, you know, Sam's Club, these giant bulk stores, they, you know, before the world of the, of the internet, right. they, they, they scratched a lot of itches that people had. Oh, absolutely right. And so this is an interesting trend story. So the headline is Amazon is about to surpass Costco on one critical measure. It's a story from Business Insider, which is a great outlet, folks, if you're not familiar with Business Insider online, it's super. A story by Kate Taylor. And let's get into the story. It says Amazon Prime is closing in on Costco as membership numbers soar. So this is a great news for Amazon and not so great for Costco, as we're going to find out here. There are now roughly 80 million Amazon Prime members in the United States. In the United States, 80 million as of March 2017, according uh, to Consumer Intelligence Research Partners estimates. Now get this, that's a 37.9% increase from the 58 million members Amazon had at this time last year. Man, oh man. Wow. I mean, wow. Any company, if their stock price increased that much or their subscriber base, anybody would be thrilled with a nearly 40% increase. Mm -hmm. oh, it's staggering. Now here's the sad part for Costco. <clears throat> Excuse me, although I don't think Costco is going to go away anytime soon. No, no. <laughs> Costco, meanwhile, reported in March that it had 88.1 million total card holding members. For a long time, analysts argued Costco was Amazon proof. Hmm. In December of 2015, for example, Deutsche Bank's Paul Trussell wrote in a note to investors that Costco would remain unaffected by the e-commerce giant, meaning Amazon, due in part to the budget retailer's membership model. However, now, however, Amazon Prime's membership is starting to eat into Costco's business. And it, the conclusion is the percentage of US households that only pay for Prime membership has more than doubled over the past four years from 7.1% in 2013 to 162 in 2016, according to a note published by Cowan and Company last September. In the same time span, and this is really heartbreaking for Costco folks, in the same time span, the percentage of households that only have a Costco member membership, pardon me, uh, shrank from 14.9% to 9.8%. So again, I, I don't think Costco is gonna go anywhere. It's not like it's gonna be the end of the, the world for them, but it is interesting. Well gradually right. more and more ben it's it's e-commerce is you know putting pressure on brick and mortar you, you can't deny it well I, you know in these numbers they really don't spell out that grim picture for me because you know the only thing it tells me is that the percentage of households that have only a costco membership well, went went, went down that doesn't mean that you know uh that five percent dropped their membership it means that 
five percent of that only used to own uh, a Costco membership One. now yeah. also have both, or well, you know, yeah, they can yeah. potentially have both. So you know, it, it you know to me like uh, I, I don't know how it is in your in your family, but definitely Amazon Prime because you know aside from the shipping and the deals you get, but Amazon Prime has a lot to offer besides just shopping perks. Oh it has boy, yes, tons, ton, like literally tons of stuff. So I, I mean. To me, this isn't Costco's doom. This is Costco is having to, you know, Costco's kind of, you know, in share with, or they are uh, kind of harmonizing with Amazon more than anything else, I would assume. The numbers that, that are in the article, um, again, not knocking, uh, you know, the publication, but they don't spell out doom and gloom to me. They just say, they just show a trend that, hey, you know, people are having both instead of just one. I like your assessment. You make me feel better <laughs> since I have great affection for Costco. Right. So you've made me feel better. <laughs> well, you know, and there are other trends you can look at. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but the last time we purchased a television, which was exclusively mm -hmm. a Costco or Sam's Club endeavor, uh, yeah, we just ordered one online. I mean, you know, there, there are other trends to look at, but these particular numbers – I, again, don't spell the end of Costco, which is good, you know, which is, yeah. which is great. Well, yeah, and you talk about buying a TV. Uh, for me, and you know this already, but for me, the absolute slam dunk, killer customer relationship binding agent that makes me loyal to Costco when it's time for me to buy a TV or a stereo or whatever electronic gear is that 90-day, no questions asked. Yeah. You don't like the smell of it. You don't like the look of it. <laughs> You've become tired of it. You want a new mistress. They don't care. You can bring it back full refund. Or, of course, if there's a problem, there's no question. You can exchange immediately. I don't know of any big retailer, certainly brick and mortar, that has that kind of incredible return. It's one of the weirdest things about when you exit our Costco, and I'm sure it's true for many other Costcos, you see the return line. Mm -hmm. And some of the stuff that's coming back, you think, holy smokers, I mean, how could somebody buy this 70 inch diagonal TV and decide, no, it's not for me, unless it's faulty, right? Right. But I think there's a lot of this, it's a, abused, I'm sure, by some users. But again, to me, when you're buying a high ticket item in electronics, the idea that you can bring it back, Wow, computer, tablet, all those kinds of things, unbeatable. Right, day. right, oh, and, and you know, and and some people they do they they do abuse it. Someone came back with a half jar of the little pretzel bites, that kind of thing. I don't know why, <laughs> but you know, it's, wh whatever fills your whatever fills your day. So, all right. So story number six, if you're following yes. along, uh, Google becomes first foreign internet company to launch service in Cuba. Yes, isn't this fun? Another Google story, but I couldn't resist because of the, the Cuba factor, right? Mm -hmm. uh, PC World Magazine story by Martin Williams, and it, it's just sort of a fun thing to think about. It, it's inevitable. You know, what we need to do, I'm going to stop for a second. Sure. What the world needs to do is somehow get this great consumer technology into North Korea. If we could just break into that country and expose their people to the glories and wonders of Hulu, Netflix, you know, all this stuff translated in Korean, of course, we could free the free these people from their maniac dictatorial I, I, world. I, I definitely like your <laughs> initiative to kind of, you know, really tackle t tackle an oppressive regime with information because that's probably the best way to do so. Oh, yeah. um, there's the pesky things called sanctions and blah, blah, yeah, blah. But yeah. no, it, it, the spread of information is invaluable. And, you know, as we as we are about to see in Cuba and I'm sure in other places, it's a. Uh, it changes lives. It really does. It does. It's inevitable. Once once that door opens to pop culture and other things like this, you can't. It's very hard to close the door behind you or to shut it off and stop mm -hmm. it. But anyway, I digress. So the stories about Cuba getting uh, a Google becomes the first foreign internet company to launch service in Cuba. So it's not that they hadn't had any internet connectivity, but it's the first foreign internet company to launch service in Cuba. So it says Google servers inside Cuba are now live on the internet, marking a major milestone in the country's communications evolution and promising faster access to Google services for Cuban users. The computers are part of Google's global network of caching servers, which store frequently requested content locally so it doesn't have to be accessed over long distances. Very smart, right? 
That speeds up access in any country, but it's particularly important in a nation like Cuba, which has relatively low connectivity to the rest of the world. Not surprising, right? Cuba is connected to the rest of the internet almost exclusively via the ALBA, A-L-B-A-1, ALBA-1 submarine cable, which runs from the island of Venezuela, said Doug Madori, uh, Director of Internet Analysis at DIN Research, that's D-Y-N. DIN was first to spot the emergence of the Google caching servers on the internet. Madori said that Google servers represent the first time a foreign internet company has hosted anything inside the country. Today, surfing the internet is still an expensive pastime in Cuba. Government run, note that, government run internet cafes charge several, several euros for an hour or two of online time. Now, a couple of euros doesn't sound a lot to us in the developed West, right, or in Europe. But get this, a large amount, that a couple of euros is a big amount of money in a country where the average wage is about 20 euros a month. What? I, you know, and it's not even that it would, you know, cost a lot. I think if people had to pay, you know, $5 an hour or $3 an hour, I think for what we experience here, you know, with free Wi-Fi to every Starbucks airport, yeah, right. um, you know, whatever, like, I think people would ride if they, or even McDonald's oh, had to do away with it. It's uh, it's expected to have free Wi-Fi, but not there. And then that opens the door to net neutrality, but we won't go there right now. Right. <laughs> That's a whole other oh, yeah. soapbox to climb up on. Goes on with the story. It says here, Google first entered Cuba in early 2016 when it set up its own tech center and Wi-Fi service at the Gallery of Cuban Sculptor Alexis Livia Macado, M-A-C-H-A-D-O, who uses the name K-C-H-O-Cuchcut, I can't even say it for his <laughs> right. work. Anyway, so they set this up with an artist studio, which is an interesting choice. The new caching service is the result of a deal signed by Google with Etesca, mm -hmm. E-T-E-C-S-A, a, a state-run telecommunications carrier in December 2016 when Alphabet Executive Chairman Eric Schmidt was in Havana. Of course, Alphabet is a Google company, right? You can test it for yourself. This is kind of fun. You can test it for yourself. The following Cuban IP address will redirect your browser to your closest Google caching server. Kind of interesting. Although I didn't do it because I thought maybe Uncle Sam might go, what's Ralph doing with this Cuban server bit here? <laughs> I'm kidding. Google did not immediately respond to a, request for, to a request for comment. But anyway, fun story, interesting, and an inevitable another domino falling down in the um, westernization, I would think, of, of Cuba and implications for other nations too, you bet. Right. Well, the uh, you know the, the IP address that they give here, one ninety dot ninety two one twelve dot twelve, is uh, you know it just redirects you to, of course, a Google search engine. And but the thing is that that IP is registered in Cuba, so mm -hmm. you know this is, so that's a big thing there. But no, I, I mean you know I think you're absolutely right. Where when the relations uh, when the relationship unthawed, you know uh, Obama a year or two ago. I mean, right. the internet there was atrocious. It, it was, you know, kilobits a second for uh, tens of dollars. And to set up your own dedicated uh, internet, you would get, you know, maybe maybe dial-up speed for hundreds right. of dollars. And again, with a place with the average uh, earning power of like, what, 20 euros a month or, or $22 a month, that was unfeasible by yep. the general public. So yeah, yeah. So Google getting in there makes perfect sense. It's a great, uh, you know, it's a great place to, uh, of course, you know, with tourism coming back, it's going to start exploding. And well, you know, it's going the the economic growth is going to be amazing, and Google wants a part of that. So oh yeah, and and talking about tourism on my bucket list, I absolutely would love to go to to Havana. I you think know, it'd be and, fascinating. And that's the weird thing is that. You know, uh, for America and as an American centric uh, show, I think a lot of our, you know, I think a lot of our listeners, and especially uh, maybe some older listeners, they think of Cuba as this wasteland. They think of 1950s cars. They think of them as, you know, what have you. But at the same time, it's, you know, other people have been, you know, being tourists there in Europe and, you know, in other places for a long, long time. Like they're not, you know, Stone Age throwbacks. They're modern. It's just, the U.S. thinks of them as, oh, you know, right. we we haven't paid attention to them since the '50s, so no one's paid attention to them since the well, '50s. Not and, not, and not the case. 
related to your point, Europeans, Canadians, and others have been going there for vacation for years and years and years. It's yeah. not like that. Not like the entire world was shut out of Cuba. It was us. Right. That so, just, you know, put up yeah. a wall. Yeah. So, so that's definitely a thing. So, all right. Uh, moving on to this next one. And, yeah. you know, and, and this is one that, again, build, <laughs> building, I will say, is kind of your specialty uh, yes. because it is your day job out there at Autodesk. Yeah. But uh, Dutch, let's see. see yeah. So, so what is this? And emojis. Put them everywhere. They're fun. So what is this? Yeah, yeah. This is from a publication that, of course, and as what Ben is alluding to at Autodesk, I'm in the architecture, engineering, construction side of the family doing press relations and so forth for that group. And so one of the publications that we we track very closely and contribute materials to and so forth is one called Building Design and Construction, which is a great publication. You don't have to be an architect construction geek to enjoy this magazine. It's it's very readable, it's very approachable, and they have fun, fun stories, some very serious and some kind of whimsical like this one. So this story is by David Malone, Building Design and Construction magazine. The title is Dutch Building Incorporates 22 Emojis into its facade i couldn't resist and the pictures are fun to see by the way folks if you have the show notes so here's the story it's kind of tongue-in-cheek emojis tend to elicit fairly strong reactions from people many people love to use the small ideograms while texting and emailing like modern day hieroglyphics others experience a visceral hatred anytime they see one of the little buggers <laughs> The, this dichotomy is best exemplified via a teaser trailer for the Emoji Movie. On mm. one hand, the movie studio felt secure enough in the general public's love of emojis to invest money in a feature film. But on the other hand, the trailer has received, at the time of this article was written, uh, more than 78,000 dislikes compared to just 8,000 likes on YouTube since its release. Well, regardless of what the prevailing opinion of, of the general public may be, one architecture firm decided to take emojis out of the digital world and incorporate 22 of them into the design of its building's facades. So they got to see the pictures. It's pretty comical. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't know what to – who knows what 100 years from now someone's going to think. But anyway, the red brick structure, which well, is – Ralph, 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 this is, uh, this is our generation's hieroglyphs. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> I mean, I think it's a hoot and a half, and it's harmless, and what mm -hmm. the hell, why not? <laughs> it's better than gargoyles or something like, you know, the usual stuff. Right. The red brick structure, which resides in the Dutch city of Amersfoort, A-M-E-R-S-F-O-O-R-T, has horizontal bands of white concrete acting as floor demarcations. So horizontal bands, right? At each intersection where the brick and the concrete meet, a small decorative circle is stamped in the concrete. On the side of the building that faces the town square, these concrete circles become emojis. The building is a mix of ground floor retail and residential units and is part of the second phase of a larger mixed use development. The second phase creates a more fully fledged mall and adds more shops, restaurants, and apartments to connect the shopping center that already exists. While the emojis may cause some passersby to groan and shake their heads, the emojis will also act as a visual timestamp. The architects hope the feature will be a unique reminder of the time period the structure was built in. And then there's a link here for more images and information on this. So it's a fun little story. So they're using emojis to purposely date the building and you know obviously uh <laughs> like most trends nowadays emojis are probably not going to stay around forever or at least these iterations are not going to stay around forever but i can see why they wanted to do it and yeah. you know it's uh it, it like you said it's fun it's different it's uh it's it's a situation of why not rather than why yeah, that's it <laughs> right why not and it to, to uh edify it to preserve it in a concrete physical way no pun intended on concrete it's it's kind of comical <laughs> right no a absolutely and so yeah and you know regardless of what you think of a, a an emoji movie uh i think we're going to move on but at the same time very very cool so <laughs> um let's see actually let me just look through real quick yeah so we have about you know maybe four or five more stories that we're not going to be able to get to right um but why don't we for everyone out there listening uh, let's get down to story number 10 because, okay. you know, it, it's, a uh, it's fun to talk about, you know, kind of building things and future things, but what about something that is like, I haven't talked about this on the show yet. I definitely want to get one of these companies on to talk about monitor technology because 
it's yes. really in for a breakthrough with technology that we're about to talk about that, you know, just like uh, consider the difference between high definition television yep. and standard de definition. I think we're heading for a similar jump in computer monitor technology. So let's start with this one. But remember, this is cutting edge on what's coming in the next couple of years to everyone. That, that's right. This is definitely an out. That's one of the reasons I jumped on this story and thought it'd be fun to share. So this comes from the uh, online outlet called Ars Technica. So that's A-R-S space Technica. Okay? By the way, I think last time you were on, you were wondering, what does Ars Technica mean? I looked yeah. it up. It yeah. is the art of technology is Latin. Oh, thank you. Fun fact. Okay, that All right, let's is get into fun. This. I love it. So Ars Technica, story by Mark Walton. Now, here's the headline. Acer Predator X27. And then there's a colon. 4K, HDR, and 144 hertz G-Sync for the ultimate gaming monitor. Then the subhead of the title is there's no price or release date yet but expect it to be very expensive. So this is cutting edge kind of stuff. There's a beautiful image of the monitor as a very cool looking stand, by the way. So here's the story. Acer has unveiled what may just be the perfect gaming monitor. So long as you don't like ultra wides, at least. The Predator X27 is Acer's take on Nvidia's prototype HDR monitor design first unveiled at the Consumer Electronics Show in 2017. That would be in January of this year, right folks? And features a 27 inch 16 by nine panel, 4K ultra high def resolution, HDR, a wide color gamut, local dimming backlighting, and a super fast 144 hertz refresh rate. And yes, it supports G-Sync for super smooth variable refresh rate gaming. Now, by mm -hmm. the way, this could have applications in other fields just beyond gaming. I'm sure uh, that of course. many people are realizing that too. But anyway, digging further into the specs reveals some serious high-end tech. The X27 monitor is based on an AU Optronics M27 0Q AN 02.2 AHVA panel. <laughs> Say that five times fast. <laughs> With quantum dot technology. Hmm. That's the same quantum dot dot, pardon me, quantum dot tech Samsung uses in its best 4K television, which up uh, which promises deeper blacks and better colors. Indeed. The X27 supports both HDR10 and 96% of the DCI-P3 color gamut. Now, some people who are really geeks into this, and I don't profess to be one of them, this might mean a great deal. It also features 1,000 nits of brightness and a 4 MS, that would be uh, milliseconds? Yes, a 4 yep. milliseconds response time alongside its 144 hertz refresh rate. Right. Whoa. And 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 just to be clear, Ralph, uh, we are just about out of time, so we're probably not going to finish this. But I will say about this monitor that yeah. you know it, it has a lot of really cool technology in it. And at the same time, it's, you know, it's kind of what you expect of like a high-end television screen, but instead it's for your computer. And again, like I was saying before, 144 hertz like right now about 60 is, is the standard for monitors but when you switch to a 144 hertz monitor it's kind of the same as switching from you know uh just a 1080p television to a 4k right. television like everything right. everything just looks so smooth and so buttery it's so nice um but yeah no th this this is going to be amazing but ralph like i said we're just about out of time in about a minute ralph where can people go to find more information about you, Autodesk? Uh, <laughs> what are you up to? Well, yeah. I'll tell you what. For Autodesk friends, go out to simply Autodesk, A-U-T-O-D-E-S-K dot com. Find out about Autodesk. It's more than computer-aided design software. It's more than AutoCAD. Uh, we have software that I've mentioned so many times before that is powerfully important in the entertainment industry. The last, I don't know, 18 Academy Awards for special effects were to artists and, and firms using Autodesk software. People don't know this. It's a fun, fun thing to discover. And then one last thing, I, a few weeks ago, I was out in Boston and I went to a job site from the massive international construction firm Skanska. I want to thank the guys at Skanska for a wonderful tour of the 121 Seaport building in Boston. Google that, learn about it. 
fascinating building built over a very challenging urban site with state-of-the-art technology. So thanks again to my friends at Skanska for that tour. Perfect. All right. Very well said. And Ralph, we're just about out of time. Thank you so much for joining us here. Uh, again, it was a lot of fun and glad that we could get you back on. I know that you were sick. Happy to hear that you are feeling and, of Yay. course, sounding better. <laughs> and everyone else out there, thank you so much for joining us here on Computer America. We are just out of time. Tune in next time for, again, more great guests, news stories, and, hey, giveaways as well. Catch you next time. See you later. Bye-bye.